Well, here we are again, Philosophy 81, and this will be our last lecture for the course. So today we're going to talk about Shintoism, and Shintoism is quite different than all of the other religions that we have covered so far. It's actually different than just about every religion, Eastern or Western. So Shintoism is also known as Kami no Michi, which means the way of the gods. Shintoism is all about the Kami, or the gods. We can call them gods, but basically they're more like spirits, um, uh, in, in that there is no one all-powerful deity that is seen as, you know, the creator or the maintainer or anything like that. There are many, many of these Kami. They have limited powers and they have different abilities. And um, there's estimated to be over 8 million of them. So again, they are uh, plentiful. Don't worry, I'm only going to ask you to list about 250,000 on the exam. Okay, that was a joke. Um, but the Kami, they are spirits that inhabit all sorts of things, and they are particularly fond of nature. So you will find them in trees and in uh, streams and mountains and all other forms of nature. They also can inhabit things that have to do with uh, the human world and non-natural things. So it is a religion that is definitely polytheistic, multiple gods, and it's verging on pantheistic, which would be gods in everything, um, but definitely polytheistic. So it's um, based on the folk religions and traditions and rituals and customs of Japan. And it goes back to around 300 common era, perhaps earlier than that, but we don't have anything that we can trace back further than that. It was an oral tradition, so it was passed on uh, verbally, orally, from, from person to person, from generation to generation until um, around 600 Common Era. And um, around 600 to 650, Chinese and Koreans began to come into Japan and they brought writing. The Japanese didn't have any writing until then. So even though the Japanese writing and Chinese writing are different, they uh, were influenced by the Chinese and, um, and developed their own writing system. We also know that then prior to around 600 Common Era, there was no influence from outside groups, no influence, no shifting of the religious views. Uh, you know, it was tight, it stayed what it had begun, and it was purely a Japanese uh, ideology. So some of the things that make it very different. One, there's, there's no founder. Right? This isn't credited with there being a particular start of the religion. Their view is that this is just the way it is. It's, well, it's how it is. It's always been this way. There's no founder. Um, it's also um, not dogmatic. That's, that's pretty important because there are no real rules that say, look, you have to have this kind of behavior or attitude. You have to develop these virtues. You need to follow these rules. In fact, it is almost free of rules and, and other dogma. Um, so there's no concept of enlightenment, no concept of um, human perfectibility or um, things like Karma, even. They didn't believe in reincarnation, and so uh, karma wasn't part of it. You lived your life, and if you lived a good life, things would benefit you perhaps in the afterlife. We'll talk more about that. Or um, maybe there would be a, a cult or a following that would build up around you, and those people would remember you. You might even become a kami in the afterlife. So what we see then is that these tensions that are happening in the world, and you know, there's chaos, there's disharmony everywhere. We've talked about it in every religion and people trying to solve it through their religious views, perhaps. The idea in Shintoism is that that tension is 
is not because of people and chaos and disharmony because we're doing it. It's because of unpredictable calming. The, the disruption of harmony is not human made. It's made by the kami. In fact, some kami really, uh, their only purpose or their only focus is to disrupt things and destruct things. So different kind of kami have uh, different views, but all of them are unpredictable and all of them are moody. So that becomes a problem. Um, we have things like, you know, let's say, okay, your cell phone stops working. Um, what do you do? Well, most of us take it to a repair shop or try and fix it. Um, if you're a, a Shinto follower, what you might think is that a kami has inhabited your cell phone and stopped it from working. So maybe the, the kami is messing with you. Maybe it's angry. So what you should do then is build a little shrine. You build a shrine set it by your phone or set your phone by it and you make an offering to that kami and you try and sway it so that it will either go away leave your phone or at least stop messing w with your phone you want it to have a favorable view of you so that it will not um uh continue to mess with you and this this is something that is very common. Um, so in Japan, almost all houses have some sort of shrine in their house that is a shrine to the kami. There are, of course, major public shrines um, in the islands of Japan. But you also see shrines popping up all over the place on the street. Um, it's funny because you can be, uh, and when you visit Japan, you can be walking down the street and, you know, you go one direction and you go into a store, you go shopping and then you come out and you go, you're going back the other way and you pass an area and now a shrine has popped up because somebody has a, a, a problem with a kami that is inhabiting that spot or that area. And so they've made a shrine hoping to, to, to please it and make it uh, go away. And the idea is that you are trying to create a temporary piece or a temporary state of harmony within the world because an offering to the kami doesn't ensure forever happiness, right? It is just a temporary fix. There are the shrines that people have that are individual. There are the shrines that are um, done by families. There are, you know, there are rituals that are done by the individual rituals that are done by the family, by the village, by the town, by the state, by the country. So um, what we've got going on here is uh, a relationship with the kami that drives this religion. It's not really about much else. It is how you interact with the, the kami and how they interact with you. So rituals and festivals and um, vari various rites and offerings are all a huge part of it. As far as scripture, well, we don't have a scripture like we've had with some of the other religions. Certainly we don't have a scripture that tells us right and wrong um, and what to do. What we have is um, a book called the Kojiki, K-O-J-I-K-I. -I, the Kojiki, which is essentially um, you could say stories about people and the gods or the kami and how they interact and how the kamis interact with each other, how the kamis came into being, those kind of things. So um, you learn from those stories, right? Um, you learn how to treat others from following the images or the stories that are in the book. So your textbook gives you the cosmogony. What's that word mean again? Oh yeah, it's the creation story. So your textbook gives you a cosmogony and I'm going to give you one. Um, it is it is similar, but it gives you a little more detail. The, the one uh, that's in your textbook is a little sanitized. It's it's kind of cleaned up for family viewing. I'm going to give you the 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 real view. Um, so here's here's how the world began according to Shintoism. 
Um, first, there were what we call, or they call, sky kami. These are the kami, or um, the gods, that arose from the primordial chaos um, to the floating bridge of heaven. Um, visualize that as there is no land, there's no sky, there's just basically, you know, ooze or, um, you know, uh, think of it as clouds, that's even fine. And um, within that, somehow the sky kami came to be. It doesn't matter how that happened. They're not acting. They're not asking questions like, well, where did they come from? How did they create themselves? If they created themselves, those really aren't concerns. But they continued the, the first kami, the sky kami, created other sky kami, and they created the kami of birth and growth. And those are um, two kami, brother and sister. The male, br uh, the brother is named Izanagi, and the female is named Izanami. So we have two uh, kami of birth and growth who are brother and sister. And the sky kami say to them, or say actually to Izanagi, the male, why don't you tip your or put your um, jeweled tipped spear into the moisture below and stir it around? And he says, okay. So he does and he sticks his spear in there and he pulls it out. And when he pulls it out, drips come from the tip of his spear and they accumulate and form the first island of Japan. So, well, the, the main island of Japan. We don't have oceans or the world, but we have the main island of Japan, which comes from the drips from the tip of Izanagi's spear. Then the sky kami say to Izanagi and to Izanami, look, we've made a rainbow bridge from the sky down to the land, down to the island that you just created. Why don't the two of you go down um, the, the, the rainbow bridge, erect a pillar on the land to mark it as the first land and, um, and make everything good. So they say, oh, okay. So they go down the, they go down the rainbow bridge, they get to the land, they build a pillar. And then Izanami, the female says to her brother, Izanagi, my, what a handsome young man you are. And he says, well, what a beautiful young maiden you are. And then she says, what if we, or why don't we go around the other side of the pillar and get to know each other? And he says, oh, okay. So they do, they go around to the other side of the pillar and by getting to know each other means they have sex. So they have sex and she gets pregnant immediately and gives birth immediately. And she gives birth to swamps. So now this land that they created has swamps in it. So they have sex again and she gets pregnant again and gives birth immediately again and gives birth to leeches. And, um, and so they, they're kind of like, well, this, this is awful, right? Now we've got these blood sucking bug things and it's nasty swamps. So, you know, they go back up the rainbow uh, bridge and when they get up there, they talk to the sky kami and they say, why, why was that so awful? And the sky kami said, because the woman spoke first and because the woman initiated sex. So we're not done with the story, but we can already see from that story right there that we have um, some ideas about what women should do and how they should act. A woman should not speak first. A woman should not initiate sex. In fact, even in Japan today, among traditional Japanese, there will be, uh, you know, a 10 foot or 10 step distance between the husband and the wife with the wife walking behind him. So they don't walk side by side. Anyway, so they say, uh, the sky kami say, you, you created this because of the, the woman being in, uh, inappropriate. So go back down the bridge and fix it. So they, they do, they go back down and they get to the pillar. And this time the brother is says, 
what a beautiful young woman you are. And she says, what a handsome young man you are. And he says, would you like to go around to the other side of the pillar and get to know each other? And she says, yes, I would. So they go around to the um, other side of the pillar and they have sex and she gets pregnant and um, gives birth and she gives uh, birth to the other islands of Japan. So there are eight islands making up the, the um, strip of Japanese uh, territory. And so the first one is from the trip, the drips from the tip of the jeweled spear and the other seven she gives birth to them and they actually had sex seven times and she gave to uh, birth to an island each time they keep having sex and she keeps getting pregnant immediately and she keeps um giving birth immediately and she gives birth to rivers and to mountains and to all of the different animals and to humans and all of the things that are, you know, abstract things like the wind and the, you know, the, the, the fire and so forth. And when she gives birth to fire, it kills her. I don't know why giving birth to a mountain didn't kill her. But anyway, the story is that when she gave birth to fire, it killed her. And when she died, she went to the land of the dead, which is called a Yomi, Y-O-M-I. And, um, the land of the dead is not a place of punishment. It's not like a hell. It's just a place where you go when you're dead. You know, since the religion doesn't have this big argument or this big concern about perfecting yourself and overcoming sin, um, there's no punishment, right? You die, you go to this place where dead things go. So she goes down to the land of the dead to, to Yomi. And Izanagi, her brother, wants to go with her because he, you know, wants to be with her. And she says, "Nope, don't, don't follow, don't follow." And he, he begs and he pleads. And she's down there for a little while, and he is begging, "Please, I love you. I want to be with you. I miss you. Please let me come down there, and um, and visit." And she keeps saying, "No, no, you can't. This is only for the dead." And the it's the land of decay and so forth. And so finally. He begs enough that she says, okay, you can come and visit me. And when he does, he comes down into the, the land of Yomi and she won't look at him. She keeps her face hidden from him. And he says, um, Izanami, I, I, I love you so much. You're my sister and uh, my lover. And, you know, I, I want to be with you. And she, again, is still hiding from him. And so... Uh, he's, please, I love you. Let me touch you. Let me look at you. And so finally, she removes her hand and she looks at him. And she has begun to decay already. Like she's got an eyeball hanging out. And, you know, part of her teeth are falling out and everything. And um, so she is, you know, decaying. And she turns around, she looks at him and he says, okay, never mind. I'm good. I got to go. And he splits. I mean, he leaves in such a hurry because she's not the beautiful young woman he wants. Um, he leaves in such a hurry that the, um, the forces of decay and death and disease and um, uh, the thunder demon, they all follow him out. Like he, he leaves so quickly that they're able to escape the land of Yomi with him. And they are um, basically bent on destroying humans. So they start setting about disease and killing things and um, destroying things. And so at that point, Izanagi vows to create life faster than they can destroy it. So in order to preserve life and create life, he then must do what he does that creates things, which is to have sex. So um, it sets up another ideology that men then are entitled to as much sex as they want. But um, he starts having sex. But before he starts having sex and creating things, he has to purify himself. He's been down in Yomi, in the land of the dead, right? Um, so it's, it is a... Uh, you know, contact of any type with the dead is the main form of human pollution. So he has to have purification and ritual purification. Purification is one of the big practices in Shintoism. So you've got your relationship with the kami, 
but you also have to do the various purifications. And so generally, when you visit a Shinto shrine or temple, you would go and there is a place where there is water and there are cups, like bamboo cups on the end of a stick, and you scoop in some water and you rinse off one hand and then you scoop up more water and rinse off the other hand and then you scoop up and drink from it and you know, wash out your mouth and then spit that out so that you've purified yourself. So he purifies himself and as he is doing it, he's rubbing his eye. And as he's rubbing his eye and cleansing his face, out pops a daughter. Her name is Amaterasu, and she winds up becoming the primary kami in Shintoism. He continues purifying himself, himself and he does his, his, um, his right eye. And out from the right eye pops another kami uh, named Tsukiyomi, and he is the moon god. So Amaterasu is the sun god. Uh, Tsukiyomi is the moon god. So he's cleaned his eyes and then he's purifying his nose and he, you know, he's blowing his nose and out with the snot comes a, a son uh, named Susano and Susano is the storm god and he pretty much is born angry. He, he is not um, a, a pleasant fellow. He's referred to as, you know, the unpleasant brother. And so we have these three uh, deities that come directly from Izanagi. Um, <clears throat> Tsukiyomi, the moon god, there's just not much we need to know about him. But Amaterasu, of course, is important. And then Susano is important because Susano, being the jealous, unpleasant brother, he wants to fight with Amaterasu all of the time. He's angry that he came out of <laughs> Izanagi's nose instead of his eye. He's angry that she has power that he doesn't have. She has the power of the sun. Um, he just can stir up some storms and he does. He makes a lot of storms because he's, he's angry. But he wants to fight with her a lot and a lot of the stories contained in the Kojiki are stories about the battles between Susano and, um, and Amaterasu. One of the ones that um, is an, an interesting and important story is that he teases her and uh, shames her and harasses her and she gets so fed up with him because he is such a jerk that she decides to go into a cave. And she goes down deep into this cave. Well, when the sun goddess goes into the cave, so does the sunlight. So the whole world falls into darkness. The other kami and the people and, of course, the animals, everything needs the sunlight. And so they are begging her to come out. And she says, nope, I'm, I've had it with you. I've had it with my brother. I'm, I'm done. I'm going to stay in here with my, my beauty and my, my loveliness, right? And so um, what the other kami figure out is a way to trick her to come out of the cave. So what they do is they get a bunch of mirrors and they hang them from all of the trees and set them all about uh, on the outside area of the cave. And, um, and they start making noise and they beat on drums. You may have seen the large Japanese drums and there are, there are demonstrations where people are doing these moves and they're banging on each side of the drum and so forth. Um, they're called taiko drums. Well, this is out of uh, Shinto culture, Shinto practice. The gods are easily distracted and apparently they like to sleep a lot. So making noise and doing shiny things is a, a, an important way to draw the attention of the kami. If you want to have a kami come and visit you or be with you or you want to do a ritual, generally they slap their hands three times and, um, and make noise. So we've got um, drums beating and and symbols clanging and so forth. But anyway, what happens here with Amaterasu, she's down in the cave. She doesn't want to come out. They hang up all of these mirrors and they start beating the drums and clapping the symbols. 
and um, she hears all of this noise and she's like, what is that about? And she looks out of the cave to see where all this noise is coming from. And when she does, of course, her light shines out and reflects off of the mirrors. So now she sees all of these light points, all of this light that's just as bright as her because it is a mirror of her and she doesn't realize it's a mirror. And she's like, who's out there trying to take my place? Who is out there who thinks that they can, they can be me? So she comes out of the cave to confront this other light source, right? And when she does that, the other Kami go behind her and they take a big rope, I mean a very large diameter rope, and they tie it into a particular knot across the cave. The rope is called a Shimanayo. And the idea is that uh, they've blocked off the cave and so uh, she can't go back in. She is now trapped outside and has to resume providing sunlight for th the world. The rope, the Shimanayo, is one of those symbols that is used in Shinto, um, Shintoism. You'll see it around the shrines. You'll see it as just a general symbol of Shinto practice. So we've got ideas here of gods and performing rituals and um, making the gods or the kami happy so that they don't um, mess with us. We also have different types of kami. So originally we have the kami that were the sky kami and they maintained themselves in the sky. But we have three other types. We have the deified abstract powers the clan ancestors, and then the souls of the dead. So the deified abstract powers. An abstract power would be something like the power of the sun or, or the power of uh, heaven or the power of rivers and animals and other natural things. Um, these are things that have commies behind them, I guess is the easiest way to say it. For example, there would be perhaps a, a, a main kami associated with rivers or with mountains. We know that Amaterasu is the deified abstract power of the sun. So she is definitely a bona fide um, kami because she is the goddess of the sun and the highest, highest uh, deity within Shintoism. We next have clan ancestors. Clan ancestors are the first ancestors of a family line. So way back when humans were made and born, the first humans born from uh, Izanami and then uh, they mated with, uh, with Kami and uh, other humans. But the very first ancestors of a particular family line um, are, are uh, Kami. They become Kami. So by making the source of the family bloodline a kami, it essentially gives everyone some special blood, uh, basically specialness uh, to a certain extent of, of kami-ness, right? It also gives legitimacy, legitimacy to arist uh, aristocratic families. So they can say, well, we are, you know, the family that is in charge or that rules or whatever, because we are descendant of this particular um, uh, kami. Amaterasu, deified abstract power, power of the sun, okay, is also a clan ancestor. She, um, being born of Izanagi and Izanami, is a kami. But she had a family and her grandson um, was sent or she sent her grandson to rule Japan, set him up as the ruler. So from that point on, all ruling families of Japan claim to be direct descendants of Amaterasu. So they weren't just part Kami, right? They were part of Amaterasu. So they... Um, they have the right and the legitimacy to rule because they are divine.
Now, that stopped in 1946. In 1946, at the end of World War II, after Japan surrendered, as one of the conditions for the surrender, pardon me, Emperor Hirohito had to uh, dis uh, claim that he was uh, no longer, or that he had never been, uh, divine. He had to renounce his heritage of uh, uh, that traced back to Amaterasu. He had to say, look, I'm just an ordinary man. Of course, when he did that and signed the papers that said that, um, he felt humiliated, but the people of Japan, for the most part, said, yeah, okay, we know you had to sign the paper. They dropped a big-ass bomb on us, and what are you going to do? But we know the truth. We know that the Japanese family or the ruling family is a, a descendant of Amaterasu. Anyway, she is uh, a, not only a deified abstract power, and she is a clan ancestor. The third type that we have of kami are, are the souls of the glorified dead. So if someone is um, highly respected, they're a doer of, of great deeds, whether they are destructive or constructive, they become kami when they die. So all war heroes, are, or let me say most war heroes, not just you know fighters, but the war heroes, uh, all emperors. You may have heard the term kamikaze. Well, kamikaze is uh, actually it means um, a, a, a particular type of wind, but it is also applied to suicide fighters in, uh, well, in any of the wars, but we know them mostly from World War II. So kamikaze pilots were pilots who would take off from um, either a, a land base or um, a um, aircraft carrier, knowing that they were not going to make it back alive. They knew that either they didn't have enough um, fuel to make it back alive and they were going to have to just crash into the ocean, or they knew that going into the um, the battle was certain death. Their goal was to do as much damage as possible to the enemy, and um, that might mean if you are, um, uh, you know, dropping your bombs, you've dropped all of your bombs, and you don't have enough uh, fuel to make it back to safety, then you might fly your plane into a ship and um, cause it to blow up, essentially committing suicide. And so that's where we get the term the suicide bombers. But kamikaze are the fighters who are willing to sacrifice, willing to die, because they know that it will um, make them not only a war hero, but they will become ka uh, kami when they die. So instead of going to the land of Yomi, uh, they become kami. And so the number of kami is frequently growing. We can look um, at people who have, um, you know, really troubled um, souls and do something that's pretty, you know, destructive and, um, you know, that's something that's uh, really renowned. So, for example, we might look at Adolf Hitler and, and he might have been reborn a kami, um, or not reborn, but become a kami, um, because he did something that was astounding, and he was clearly um, troubled, and um, so he might have a have become a kami, but he would probably become a destructive kami. In other words, he's one of the kami that is in the world that is causing problems now, stirring things up and destroying things. Saintly people, really good people. Mother Teresa, for example, um, would be um, uh, could become a, a kami when they die, and they would probably be um, uh, a you know a, a constructive kami. And essentially, uh, we we might even look at some of the good people as being um, trapped as kami for human for human benefit. They are here to help, and uh, it may not be what they want to do, but I guess it's better than going to Yomi. I don't really know. Anyway, there are three of these types of kami. Um, 
again, you could become one if you do something. If you're if you are a kamikaze pilot and you do something remarkable for your country and for your emperor, you could become a kamikaze. Uh, uh, all right, you could become a kami. Um, most of us, however, don't live in a world where we do those kind of things. So how do we carry out being a Shinto practitioner? Well, again, we have our shrines and um, our, our, you know, offerings to the kami. But the, the biggest form is really the, the ritual. Um, we have rituals and we have Matsuri. Matsuri are the... Um, the larger festivals are celebrations, and so maybe it's a citywide or it is, a, you know, a statewide or a country ride. And the Matsuris are usually um, fixed. In other words, you know, every April we do this or every Saturday we do this. Um, and you invite the kami to the shrine to participate in the rit ritual because, again, it's this relationship between you and um, and the kami. So. In Japan, you can go, oh, I mean, anywhere, you can, you can go to a ritual any day of the year. I mean, there are multiple rituals. The ones that are nationwide, so you have, you know, festivals of the dolls, which is for girls, or you have the, the fest festival of the boys and, you know, so forth. Um, those would be, so the whole nation is having that ritual. But on any other day of the week, you can find other rituals. Some are more specialized. There's um, one uh, prefecture that uh, has um, the Festival of the Penis. And it's an interesting festival. Um, you might think, oh, well, it's showing fertility and so forth. And um, actually, no, it's not. It's a festival where um, they sell penis-shaped foods. In fact, here's a little, I don't know if you can see that real well, but it's a little lollipop or a sucker that uh, is from one of those. Apparently, you can now also get them at uh, porn shops for uh, bridal showers. Anyway, um, they sell penis-shaped foods. They carry f floats that are penis-shaped. Some of them are massive. Some of them are more um, representative than than graphic. Some of them are graphic, and they've carved them, you know, to be very, very accurate. And um, it is a celebration of the penis, although it's not actually celebration of the penis. It's more like celebration of the dildo. Here's why. This is how that f festival got started. A long time ago, a demon inhabited a beautiful young woman. And when the demon possessed this woman or inhabited her, it did two things. One, it made her insatiable sexually, so she was always looking for sex. And secondly, it made her grow teeth in her vagina. So um, what happened is this, this woman was going around, this young woman was having a lot of sex. And every time she did, the teeth in her vagina would appear and it would clamp down and bite off the penis of the man she was having sex with. Well, um, this terrified everybody and, um, and of course made them worry about what, that, what was going on. And so they devised a plan. They had the local blacksmith make a, a, a steel, or not a steel, but a metal uh, penis a dildo, a metal penis. And what they did is they inserted the metal penis into this woman that was possessed. And when the teeth came out and bit down on it, since it was metal, it broke all of the teeth. So they outsmarted the demon, the demon, and it pissed off the demon and he left, never to be heard from again. So the festival is actually celebrating the fact that the people were able to outsmart, art, outsmart um, a, a bad demon and make things better for themselves. So um, again, lots of different rituals. That one just cracks me up. Um, there are rituals that have to do that are shamanic. 
So shamanism, we've talked about a little bit before, and it's the idea that someone um, goes into a, a trance state and is able to predict or prophesize the future. They're able to deliver uh, messages from, well, in, in China it was from the, the uh, ancestors. Here it could be messages from the kami. So there are women called Miko, M-I-K-O, and um, they are temporarily possessed by a kami who speaks through her. Now what happens is a, a young woman, uh, late teens, early 20s, will just abruptly basically be possessed by one of these kami. And um, they know it happens, and well she knows it happens, but other people know it happens because her demeanor will change. So she might be a typical, um, you know, back in, the, you know, uh, in history, um, Chinese woman who is, you know, hides her mouth when she laughs and is, you know, very timid kind of. And, and then all of a sudden she might become very strong and outspoken, right? And what's happened is she's become possessed by a, um, a kami. And a lot of the original possessions were from um, shogun warriors who had died as war heroes and became kamis. And apparently they still have things to say. So they look for a person, a, a human, um, who has a spirit that they can easily push aside and then possess her. And then they can talk to people and they can say, here are things you need to know. And you can talk to them and ask them questions. Sometimes a new uh, group or cult will form around one of the Mikos. And, um, and so the, 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 the kami that has possessed her will return and return so that people can communicate. Sometimes once um, a, a, a woman has become a miko and is, is possessed by one uh, kami, she may become possessed by several and they take turns speaking. So people would go to her and um, ask questions and that's how they get the, um, the answers back. So the most famous of all of the um, cults formed around Amiko is called the Tenrikyo. And it was uh, formed around um, Nakayama Mika in 1798, or she was born in 1798. And she was possessed actually by uh, 10 different kami, 10 different shogun. And they wrote poetry and through her and created a, a new story of them, a new mythology around the shoguns that glorified the shoguns. When she died in 1887, prior to her death, she assigned another person to take over for her with the approval of the kami that had been um, possessing her. So it happens that this the, this particular cult is still in 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 still together because as one uh, ages and is going to pass on, she will find a new person to select her uh, or pardon me to replace her. And uh, again, with the the approval of the kami, so there's a continuous lineage of these kamis being able to communicate with the world, and it's um, uh, informative. And uh, truthfully, I don't know of the success rates. Like, do they say you know buy IBM, and it turns out you make fortune on the stock? I I have no idea what's actually going on with them, but it is part of the practice. So. Among the practices, you would talk to and receive messages back from the kami, and you have rituals showing them how you care and how much you care. You build shrines, not only to, um, to hopefully please them, but the shrines are actually places where the kami will live. So Amaterasu lives in the biggest shrine in Japan, it's called Ise, spelled I-S-E, and it's an interesting shrine itself because what happens is they 
built the shrine, and then 20 years later, they built another one exactly like it next to it and tore down the first. And then 20 years after that, they built one where the original one was and tore down the second. Every 20 years, they build a new shrine. And they still use the old, the original um, building techniques. They don't use nails. It's all constructed out of wood, pegs, and so forth. And um, every 20 years, so that she constantly has a new place to uh, dwell because the shrines are their homes if they want. People don't go into the shrines. People go around the shrine, shrines. They go into outbuildings. They uh, don't go in. And usually the door is covered by a shamani, a shamania a rope. And um, uh, people don't go in because that is the home of the kami. So if you're going to a shrine, as I mentioned earlier, you would stop first and you would purify yourself with the, the water and wash your hands and so forth. And you would walk through some gates that are called Tori gates. And there's a picture in your book. Um, and um, essentially it's, a, a, it's two pillars that have uh, across the top two more um, call, uh, beams. And they're almost always painted red. And they mark the entrance to an area that belongs to a kami. One shrine, <clears throat> the name of which I've forgotten, has hundreds of them all along a pathway. What happens is as you go through that gate, the tori, you are transforming yourself into a more spiritual kind of thought so that when you get to the shrine, you're not just your average person off the street, like, hey, what's up, shrine? You know, you have you have cleansed yourself and you have become more and more spiritual. So you would go to the shrine and you might do things like they have um, paper available and you can write your your question or your dream or your desire uh, on it and then hang it in the tree so it goes to the wind and whatever kami is receptive might pick it up and then you know either help you along or or not but I mean that's your hope is that someone receives it and, and is um, helpful so it's I, I like to think of it as a, a gentle religion because Nothing's really beating you up on you have to do this. Oh, you're going to go to hell or you're going to go to, you know, uh, endless births and, and next life you will be born as a, a toad or a cockroach or, you know, none of those ideas of punishment after, after life. You just go to the land of the dead and it's not punishment. So you just carry on then. And um, if you've become a kami, then you can still dwell on the earth in a non-physical form, and you can hopefully help humans, unless you're a destructive kami. But um, you know, uh, the best you can really do as a human is if you if you don't become a kami, is that people might form a following or what we might think of as a cult around you, where your name, your your ideas, your image, it would be kept alive, so to speak. So there might be a shrine that is um, offered to you, and after you're dead, here's the shrine so that you are not forgotten. But yeah, it's not like, oh, I'm going to go to heaven and have eternal peace and happiness. Um, I'm not going to go to hell and have eternal damnation. I just go from this land to the land of Yomi, and uh, I begin to decay because everything does. And while I'm here, I live my life. And I live my life according to um, the, the models or the, the stories that I have read about uh, the kami and what they do. And um, I'm good. It's, it's really pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, like I said, I think it was a kind of a gentle um, religion. Um, I think that's all I need to say about Shintoism. This is, again, the last lecture. So you will have your final exam coming up. Um, and the final exam will cover the information on China 
and Confucianism and Taoism and Japan and Shintoism. So that is pretty much it for the course. Good luck and um, see you around.